how you're doing, you tens, and welcome to another video. Just make sure that when you watch these videos, you have a pen, pencil, and a highlighter, and make sure that anything you see on the screen must be written down in your booklets. After you've watched the videos, it's good technique to go and have a read of the textbook to make sure that you've covered off everything. Now, let's get into the video. Unit 1.2, the periodic table, how do we organise the elements in the periodic tables? And in this video, we look just at the metals. How do we organise the metals? So there's two main types of elements in the periodic table, metals and non-metals. -metal the metals constitute about three quarters of all the elements. So where are the metals found on the periodic table? Okay, well we need to draw in a staircase between metals and non-metals. And the staircase runs down this part of the periodic table, with metals being on the left of that staircase and non-metals being on the right. So anything on the periodic table can be classified as a metal or a non-metal. We have a few elements that are described as having properties between metals and non-metals. They are metalloids. So they're in a special little group that are along that staircase. Some of them may be classified as non-metals, but they have some properties of certain metals, and we discuss metalloids later. The lanthanides and actinides, which are that series underneath the periodic table, they are also metals, because remember we would push the periodic table apart. Some of the properties of metals are they are lustrous, they're shiny, they're able to conduct heat and electricity, they're malleable, so they can be shaped, and they're ductile, which means they can be drawn into wires. So things like braces, metals drawn into thin wires, used in electrical circuits because they conduct electricity, shaped into cans because they are malleable. The first type of metals that we want to look at are called the group 1 metals, and they're known as the alkali metals. And they have a very interesting set of chemical and physical properties. They form what we call 1 plus charged cations. A cation is a positively charged ion. It forms a 1 plus charge because it has lost one electron. Metals like to lose electrons in chemical reactions. So if you lose something that is negative, you become positively charged. So something in group one has one electron in the outer shell, it will lose one electron to have a full outer shell, and in that case, it will lose one electron to form a positively charged ion. The group one alkali metals, well, they are also very, very reactive, and they react very vigorously with water and air. So they're too reactive to be found in nature as pure elements and they display very extreme chemical behaviour. They're in the same group, so they all have very similar reactions, and they all have very extreme chemical behaviour. Elements in group 2 are known as alkali earth metals. Because they're in group 2, they have two electrons in the outer shell, so they form plus two charged cations. They're not as reactive as group 1 metals, and they have a low melting point and they're relatively soft, they're not hard metals. We need to be able to explain some of the trends in group one and group two metals. And the trends that we need to be able to identify and explain are melting temperature, boiling temperature, conductivity, and reactivity. So the melting temperature is when something goes from a solid to a liquid. The boiling temperature is when a liquid turns into a gas. The conductivity is how well something conducts electricity, and reactivity is how vigorously something reacts. So going down group one, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium, if we look at the melting point, we can generally see that the melting point gets less. So as we go down group one, the melting point decreases. Lithium, 180 all the way down to cesium, which is 28. So the melting point of group one decreases. 
And so does the boiling point. It gets easier to turn them from a liquid to a gas, so the boiling point also decreases. Conductivity is a little bit different, but in general, if we look from sodium down, we can see a general trend that the conductivity also starts to decrease. So we would say that generally there is a conductivity decrease. And finally, the reactivity. Well, the reactivity as we go down increases. Francium is the most reactive alkali metal, so the reactivity increases. The group two metals, we can see the similar sorts of trends. So we can see that the melting point of group two metals also starts to decrease generally. However, the boiling point, the boiling point does not show any kind of trend. So we can't make any generalizations about the boiling point. Again, the conductivity, besides the first one, we see a general decrease in conductivity. So again, there's generally a decrease in conductivity as we move down group two. The reactivity, as the elements get bigger, they also become more reactive. So the reactivity increases as we go down group two. So they're the trends, and now we have to explain some of those trends. So explaining the melting point, the boiling point, reactivity, and conductivity. Well, for the melting point, we simply look at the size of the atoms. Now, as the atoms get bigger, they, they can't pack as closely together. So you can see here I've drawn a couple of little circles to try and illustrate the atomic radius, the size of these group one atoms. So lithium's the smallest and rubidium would be the biggest. And if you think of these as little spheres, then lithium can get a lot closer together than rubidium. So what's happening is lithium can pack more closely together and it's harder to break apart. It's the same for the boiling point. The bigger the atom, the further away they are from each other, the less tightly they're packed, so the easier it is to separate. So it's just a physical size. The reactivity, well the reactivity also has to do with how far the electrons are away from the nucleus. So for lithium, the electron, that one electron in the outer shell, is pretty close to the nucleus compared to rubidium, which is a long way away. It's easier for something to, to steal an electron that is further away from the nucleus than it is closer to the nucleus. Electrical conductivity comes down to how many atoms we can get in a certain amount of mass. So if we're looking at a certain amount of mass, lithium, we can get more atoms in there, so there's more delocalized electrons, which are the free moving electrons, so those ones tend to conduct electricity better. The bigger the atoms, the harder it is for electrons to interact um, with free moving particles. Now the metalloids, these are the ones that have properties that are like metals, but they might be non-metals. So we've gone through and identified those metalloids being on the border of the metals and non-metals. And they're known as metalloids. And they exhibit properties between metals and non-metals. Most of them we would describe as being unmetallic, but they can conduct electricity. So for instance, silicon and germanium are widely used in electronic devices because of what we call their semiconductor properties. They are able to conduct electricity in a very controlled way. So that means that we can have specific applications and get them to conduct electricity only how we want them to. And that's very important for some very sophisticated microchips. Thanks for watching guys. Don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you next time.